We appreciate everyone being here tonight, the presence of our visitors. Very much we want to welcome you to the Assembly of the Roy City at Church of Christ. We're glad that you've taken time to be with us. We hope that we might get to know you a little bit better after our worship service. As was announced this morning, we're going to answer a question, why? Why we teach there is only one church? The we there refers to churches of Christ. The we there refers to faithful churches of Christ. That they teach from the Scriptures that there is only one church. But before we get into the heart of our lesson tonight, we want to look at some common concepts that you find in the religious world. There may be even some here that believe some of these common concepts. But we want to examine these concepts in light of the Scripture. Some of these common concepts are these. It makes no difference what one believes or practices. Many people believe that what you believe and what you practice in religion matters not at all. That is a common concept. Sincerity is all that matters. As long as you're sincere in what you do, what you believe and what you practice does not really matter, some believe. All churches do good things to help people. They do good to help people and there is no doubt that all of the different churches help people in certain ways physically when there is a flood, when there is a hurricane, when there is a tornado, they will rally and they will get things together to help those who are in need. However, as we're going to see later on, does it help people to lie to them? Whether it's unintentional or intentional? We will see that in just a moment. Another common concept, one church is as good as another. You just join whatever church you might like because one is as good as another and you may have even seen this on billboards or even uh, bumper stickers. Join the church of your choice. Whatever church you like, you join it because of the other uh, points that are made before. doesn't matter what you believe or practice. All that matters is that you're sincere. All churches do good things to help people and one church is as good as another. If those things are correct, then you can just join the church of your choice. This concept is known as denominationalism. It's a very big word, and it simply has a concept of dividing a whole. We understand that when it comes to banking. If I want a $100 bill, I could get it in ones, fives, tens, twenties, or fifties. Those bills are less than a hundred and they're a part of one hundred. Therefore, the concept there is the concept of division. How that the money is divided up. Division is the concept in denominationalism. Denominationalism has this, this belief. They believe that there is one body. All the passages that you go to that say that there is one body in the Bible, they would agree to. They say that is the saved, as you see there in that oval. And they say all of the various denominational groups are found within that one body. That is the common concept of denominationalism. And I only had room for just a few of them because there are about 1,200 different denominations. And they would throw the Church of Christ in that circle as well. And as a result of that, that is the concept because if that is true, there's one body, but all of these various denominations, it doesn't matter which denomination you belong to. The problem is, this is not taught in the Bible. Nowhere is this concept of the one body taught anywhere in the Scripture. Let's look at why we teach that there is only 
one church. Number one, Jesus only promised one church. There is one Savior, one Jesus Christ, one Messiah, and He promised only one church. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. In the context there, Jesus is asking, who do men say that I am? Some say you're Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But who do you say that I am? And Simon spoke up and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And in verse 18, he says to, to Peter, I say also unto you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Notice the word church there. It is singular. Singular in number. It's just as singular as Jesus is singular. Just as singular as Jesus is singular. My church. One Savior, one church. It is singular in number. Every time you go into the Old Testament and you find a prophecy in the Old Testament Scriptures concerning the establishment of the church is referred to as a kingdom or a house or a family of God. And as a result of that, every prophecy prophesies of one that is to be established. Let's look at a few. Isaiah chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 talks about the mountain of the Lord's house being established in the top of the hills. Out of Zion shall go forth the law of the Lord and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And it says, the Lord's house shall be established. Talking about the church, the events of Acts chapter 2. Again, the Lord's house, singular, not houses. Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel chapter 2, Daniel is interpreting a dream of King Nebuchadnezzar. And as he's interpreting that dream, he gets to the bottom of that image and he says, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed a kingdom that shall never be destroyed again that's a reference to the church and it's a kingdom singular not kingdoms Daniel chapter 7 verses 13 and 14 again is revealed to the prophet Daniel that the saints would possess a kingdom the saints there in that context refers to those who are sanctified those who were saved under the New Testament period. And they would possess a kingdom, not kingdoms. Micah chapter 4 and verse 1. The prophet Micah prophesies very similar to Isaiah chapter 2 about the coming of the Lord's house, singular, being established, not houses. When you get into the New Testament, before the church is actually established, in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 13, the gospel of the kingdom is being preached. Not kingdoms, plural. Singular. The gospel of the kingdom. And in Mark 9 and verse 1, Jesus said, There are some who are standing here who shall not taste of death till you see the kingdom come with power. And He was referring to the church coming with power as it did in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, and that was a kingdom that was to come, not kingdoms, plural. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10 in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught His disciples to pray, Your kingdom come, not kingdoms, singular, Your kingdom come. So Jesus only promised one church. We have seen the singularity of that promise that there is but one church that He promised to establish. And the Bible says there is just one church. Here is an accurate representation of what the Bible actually teaches concerning the body. In Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 4, you have the seven ones of unity. The very first one that Paul mentions is, there is one body. Now, Ephesians 1, 22 uh, and 23 tell us that Paul is using the metaphor of a body to refer to the church. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, And he put all things in subjection under his feet, and gave him head over all things to the church, talking about Christ, 
which is His body, the fullness of Him that fills all in all. So if the church there is referring to the body of Christ, and Paul is saying there is one body, therefore there is one church. One. Singular. We find the one body concept, the one church, being described throughout the pages of the New Testament. For example, Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 5, talking about the individual Christians. So there are many members, but one body. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 17, one bread and one body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12, many members of the one body. Same verse, baptized, or excuse me, the next verse, baptized into one body. Now remember, the body is the church. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 16 says that mankind can be reconciled or brought back to God, brought back into His fellowship in one body. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23, the latter part of that verse you find that Jesus is the Savior of the body. The Savior of the singular body. As a result of that, salvation is in only one church. It's only in one church. And you can substitute the word church in every one of these passages and get the meaning of it because that's exactly what he's talking about. Many members in one church. One bread and one church. Members of the one church. Baptized into one church. Reconciled in one church. Christ is the Savior of the church. There is only one. The Bible teaches that salvation is in only one institution, the Lord's church, the church that He established. The third point we want to make tonight is this. The Bible is silent about denominations. It says nothing about the modern denominations that we find in society. Nothing at all. We look into the pages of the Bible, we find that there is no passage that says anything about denominations. I have asked denominational preachers, where is your church in the Bible? They say it's not there. Some will flat out admit it's not in the Scriptures. Denominationalism is an invention of men. It does not come from God. If the Bible is silent, then it is not the will of God. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11, if a person is to speak, they are to speak the oracles of God, the Word of God. If denominations are in the Bible, where is the passage? With all kindness, it is not there. You will not find in the Scriptures anything that talks about the denominational confusion, the 1,200 plus that you find in our society of denominations. They are not in the Word of God. It makes a difference what a person believes. It makes a difference what a person believes. That's very important. And we established this fact last week. As we looked at the Bible being the Word of God, being the revealed a will of God to us. We being under the New Testament, Matthew through the book of Revelation. It is an objective standard. It is a fixed standard. As a result of being a fixed standard that does not change, as a result of that, it makes a difference what we believe. Our belief, our thinking, must come under the authority of the Word of God. And we must be willing to make whatever changes that are necessary in our thinking, in our thought processes, to come under the authority of the Word of God. Therefore, we appeal to the Scripture. We looked at this in detail last week. We have to have the attitude of 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13. We have to look at according to what is written. 
Look at what is written in the Word of God. Because it is the oracles of God. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11. It is that objective standard that we are to follow. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 37, the things I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. They were not just the Paul, Apostle Paul's opinions. They were the commandments of the Lord because he was inspired of the Holy Spirit. The gospel that was preached to Thessalonica was the word of God, not a man-made doctrine. And the scriptures are inspired, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, all scripture, Old and New Testament, come from God. They are God-breathed. And they make us complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Therefore, we don't need creed books. We don't need catechisms. We don't need church manuals. All we need is the Word of God because those words were chosen by the Holy Spirit Himself. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9-13. through 13. This is a fixed standard that does not change and it has not changed for 2,000 years. I want you to look at this verse very carefully. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. We want to look at this because this talks about how dangerous it is to believe a lie. In the context of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul is making it very clear that Christ would not return until an event took place. And that event that took place was called the apostasy or the falling away. The church would become unfaithful. False religion would develop from the church. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, it says, And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now notice that. As we read these verses, we see something that's very clear. There is a contrast between lie and truth. If there is a contrast between lie and truth, it does make a difference what we believe. Because if we are deceived by a religious lie, notice what will happen from this text. We'll be deceived, verse 10. If we not, do not have a love for the truth, we will fall for the lie. We will be deluded. Paul says God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie because they don't love the truth. And if we believe this lie, verse 11, we are not to believe the truth if we fall for the lie. We have pleasure in unrighteousness if we allow ourselves to be deceived. And not love the truth. What will be the result of this? Perish. Verse 10. Condemnation. Verse 12. In other words, if we are deceived religiously, we will perish. We will be condemned. We will be lost for all eternity. We will go to hell. This is how serious it is. But notice in contrast to that, in believing and obeying the truth, notice in contrast to that, those who love the truth, verse 10, those who believe the truth, verse 12, what will be the result of that in this context? They'll be saved. That makes it very clear that it does make a difference what we believe. That we have to love the truth Believe the truth, and as a result of that, we will be saved. But if we reject this fixed standard and say, well, I want to interpret the Bible the way I want to. This is what I've always believed, no matter what the Bible might actually say. We reject the truth of God's Word, and we want to do things our way religiously. We will perish. We will be condemned. Because, <coughs> excuse me, we do not have a love of the truth. We do not believe the truth that will bring about 
salvation. We have to have the attitude that we love the truth, that we believe the truth, that we're willing to do whatever the truth says and make whatever changes that are necessary. Our practice must be authorized in the Word of God, the Bible, that fixed standard. We must do things according to the pattern. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 5 through 6. Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. Christ is the mediator of a better covenant established on better promises. That's the New Testament. And as a result of that, there is a pattern in the Word of God, in the New Testament, in the better covenant, just like there was a pattern in the Old Testament that Moses was to follow. We have to do all things in the name of Jesus Christ Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. That doesn't mean we just do something and then say in Jesus' name. It means it must be authorized by Him. That He is the Lord. He is the King of the kingdom. He's the head of the body, the church. His will is found in this established fixed standard, and therefore we must be willing to believe and obey His will and to submit to His authority. We must remain within the doctrine of Christ. 2 John verses 9-11. through Look at this very carefully. 2 John verses 9-11. through Again, this shows us it does make a difference what we believe. 2 John verses 9-11. through Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If someone transgresses and does not abide within the teaching of Christ, they go beyond that. John the Apostle says they don't have God. They're not teaching the will of God. But he who abides, that means remains within the teaching of Jesus Christ, has both the Father and the Son. Verse 10 and 11. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. If someone comes to you and preaches to you another doctrine, you do not endorse him in any way. You do not greet him. You don't, do not give him any encouragement in, in, in what he is doing. If you do, you share in his evil deeds. That's very serious. That does tell us that it does make a difference what we believe. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 16. Paul says in this verse, Let us walk by the same rule... Let us be of the same mind. That rule there is referring to a standard of conduct. We are to walk or live our life according to the same rule, a fixed standard, and let us be of the same mind. When we have this attitude towards the Word of God that we're going to do this, then we will be the people God would have us to be. The fifth and final thing I want you to take from this lesson is this. Division is wrong. Religious division is wrong. Denominationalism is division. You have this kind of church over here, this church over here, this church over here. In fact, you could go up to a four-corner stop in some places and on each side of the corner see four different kinds of churches each within walking distance of each other. That's wrong according to the Bible. Division is wrong because Jesus prayed for unity. He prayed for the very opposite of what we see in our society today. Look at John chapter 17, 20 through 23. In John chapter 17, you have the longest recorded prayer of Christ. 
And notice what was on the mind of Christ before He went to the cross. John chapter 17, verses 20 through 23. Jesus prayed, I do not pray for these alone, talking about the apostles, but also for those who will believe in Me through their word. That's talking about you and I and everyone from the first century time into the 21st century who believe in Jesus Christ through their word. Notice what He prays for in verse 21. That they all may be one. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved me as you have loved me. Notice how many times he uses the word one. Not divided. Not divided into little groups, but one. Paul the Apostle condemned religious division in the uh, city of Corinth that was taking place in the Lord's church. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. Paul says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, there's the authority, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and same judgment. That is the very opposite of denominationalism. In denominationalism, they speak different things. There are divisions among them. And they're perfectly divided and they have different minds and different judgments. But Paul says, no, you speak the same things. You know why? Because we all can understand the Bible the same. We can interpret the Bible the same if we get this concept out of our minds that it does not matter what you believe or that we should follow the denominational traditions of men. We have to understand that teaching things contrary to the will of God is condemned and those who do so are to be identified. Romans chapter 16, verses 17 through 18. Paul says, Now I urge you, brethren, mark those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. For those who are of such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly or appetites, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. So as we have seen tonight, I want you to consider this. This is why we teach there is only one church. Jesus only promised one. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, He shed His blood for only one. And in the first century, none of the denominations that exist today existed. There was just the church of Christ. The church that belonged to the Lord. He only promised one and He only established one. The Bible says that there is only one. The Bible knows nothing about the denominations that we find today. The Bible is silent about these denominations. You will not find them as you look into the pages of the Word of God. It makes a difference what we believe. We must believe the truth and not be deceived by the lie of the religious world. And division is wrong. It is not okay to divide up into little groups and then for everyone to join the church that they like. According to the Bible, there is really no choice. It's either the Lord's church or it's something that man came up with. And we must strive to be that church. Churches of Christ, faithful churches of Christ, are striving to the best of their ability to be that church. We're not perfect. But we are striving according to the perfect Word of God to believe and to practice what you find in the pages of the New Testament. And we're calling people out of denominationalism to come out of the confusion, to come out of the lies, to come out of the things that are contrary to the Word of God and through obedience to the Gospel be baptized into one body.
Perhaps there's someone here tonight that needs to obey, that needs to be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. Confess your faith in Christ, repent of all your sins, and be immersed. And the Lord will add you to His church. You will not be voted on. We will not give you a, a church manual or a catechism for you to memorize. We ask you only to follow the Word of God. If you have become a child of God at one time in your life and you've gone astray, we urge you to repent. Come back to the Lord as always. The choice is yours while we stand and while we sing.